as, as a fitting finale to this great conference, we're going to have uh, an excellent last discussion. My privilege to introduce to uh, two great speakers. Uh, our keynote speaker is Honorable Nasa Khadr, who will speak uh, for 20 minutes uh, following him uh, 10 minutes worth of commentary uh, by uh, Amanda Zahn Irvin. Uh, we don't need any introduction, but just to uh, to uh, set it up, um, here it is in brief. Mr. Carter spent 10 years in uh, in Danish Parliament uh, dealing with a variety of, of uh, important issues in both domestic and foreign policy, uh, and with particular interest in uh, democracy, freedom of speech, promotion of democratic values, been awarded numerous prizes for his work uh, in the area of, of freedom of speech and uh, immigrant policy and integration. He's a co-founder of Association of Democratic Muslims uh, in Denmark. Um, uh, really uh, is, is extremely knowledgeable, not only by virtue of his academic pursuits, but by virtue of his background. He was born in, in Syria. Uh, lived there uh, until he was 11 and uh, and moved to Denmark. Um, we have a, a somewhat similar background uh, in our uh, commenter, Ms. Irvin, in that she was, uh, she hails from Iran where she saw in the early years firsthand the uh, the kind of ravages and, and, and privations brought about by the Iranian revolution, including execution of many innocent people, including some of her friends. Uh, she's come to, uh, to the United States as a refugee and, um, having become a citizen, continued to fight for human rights in Iran with particular focus on the rights of Iranian women. She, of course, is the founder and president of the Alliance of Iranian Women, a group which has deep connections with Iranian diaspora and has, uh, has a lot of sway within, within Iran. And as the head of the, uh, the Alliance of Iranian Women, she works diligently to bring attention in the West, both the United States and in other democratic countries, to the plight of Iranian women under Sharia's law, and testified about those issues numerous times in congressional hearings and on, on radio and TV. Again, it's my pleasure to introduce both of them. I would also try, if we can, uh, if we can succeed, to maybe give you an opportunity to ask some questions, which I think. Uh, the, the panel discussions up to now have been so fascinating that we, we did not have much of an opportunity of interaction with the audience, so we'll, we'll try to make it happen. Please. Thank you for invite me, inviting me to speak uh, on the topic, uh, where are the Muslim moderates? The Muslim moderates exist. Uh, I am one of them. They are out there in the Muslim world, but also in the West. But uh, they are difficult to activate when we are not in crisis times. They are very busy with their studies, jobs, and so on. The moderate Muslims are typically uh, just not organized in groups like the Islamists. Uh, the Muslims in the European countries consist of approximately 5% progressives like myself, 5 persons extremist, and 90 persons in between. There is an ongoing battle between the progressive and the extremist to win the sympathy of the last 90 persons. It is an unequal battle. Not only do the Islamists uh, have better economical foundation, they are often supported by the political correctness of the liberals and left wing, and their cause is legitimized by a general ignorance of their beliefs by the public. What should be simple is actually extremely complicated. The 90% in between can turn either way. Some might become progressive and some at risk of becoming Islamists. Sadly, the Islamist groups are rather successful in the European countries at the moment. 
one of the biggest problems is that the alternatives to these groups are invisible. Too many a young Muslim, it may therefore seem as if there is no other way than the extreme way. We have to make certain that they are comfortable with practicing a more moderate form of Islam, that they feel it's okay to be moderate and to practice their religion the way they wish to. At the moment, many don't. The adult moderate Muslims are out there, and there are many of them. But they don't shout about their beliefs. Also, democracy isn't, as we used to believe, something that everybody automatically learns to love or impress. And over and over again, we have seen that immigrants can easily live and work a whole life in a Western society without ever becoming Democrats. Therefore, we have to make sure that the moderate Muslims living in Western societies understand the values of democracy and freedom, that they fully grasp the benefits of freedom of speech and the freedom of practicing religion. This is the finest but one of the most difficult tasks when we are talking about reaching a common ground both with Western society but also from global perspective. You cannot talk about mutual respect when people from one religion is forcing its norms and its rules on people of other religious beliefs. It is a dictatorship of religion when Islamists are demanding that people who aren't Muslims should follow their codes of conduct. I call these Muslims Allah's self-appointed police. As a high-profiled progressive Muslim, I meet these types all the time. One day when I was in my car on my way home from the Danish parliament, a group of young Islamists in the car next to me made a lot of hateful gestures at me. They were pointing at me while signaling uh, this signal. I drove after them and made them pull over. I asked them why they would make such behavior. They couldn't give me a serious answer, so I got back in my car and drove home. This hostile behavior, even though I have bodyguards in a car behind me, uh, this hostile behavior is something every progressive Muslim will encounter. I wasn't uh, that surprised, just offended by them. What surprised me was that they ended up suing me. They also talked to the Danish press. One of the newspaper slapped on slapped me on the front page with a headline, Carter Treatings Young Students. At the same time I was baffled, apparently they went from being mall adopted police to young students overnight. Now I mainly see the hypocrisy in their actions. I'm telling you this example because it demonstrates how many Islamists demand how, how many Islamists demand respect, but refuses to give it to people of other opinions. The Islamists demand tolerance, but they does not deliver tolerance in return. This kind of behavior is unacceptable. In order for different cultures to be able to coexist, we have to establish a foundation of mutual respect and mutual acceptance. I'm convinced that such respect is best established if the change comes from within the Muslim communities. I don't believe that people from the outside will be able to make 
think, uh, make things change. We need the moderate Muslims to show some character and demand that their fellow Muslims start behaving. Otherwise, integration in the Western societies will be doomed to fail. <clears throat> the Islamists in Denmark are a huge obstacle to successful integration. They are scaring the moderates into submission and silence. I know several stand-up comedians, writers, artists, journalists who dare not to joke about Muslims because they are scared of the consequence. During the cartoon crisis, the Islamists also made sure that the cartoons were spread to enti the entire Muslim world. At the moment, Islamists are trying to convince the moderates that democracy is against Islam, but I completely disagree with this point of view. Islam and democracy can be compatible, but you as a Muslim have to actively choose in democracy as a lifestyle and not as many Islamists try to put it about leaving Islam behind if you choose democracy. It is possible, it is possible for Islam and democracy to coexist, but you have to accept to live by the rule of law. I always say that I'm Democrat first and Muslim second. Most recently, during the general election, Danish election, we just had Salafis, Salafis, Islamists, they call themselves Salafis, printed posters and went on the streets advocating against democracy. Their, tar their target group was the moderate Muslims. Their goal was to convince the moderates that they would go against God's will if they voted. They were telling the Muslims that the only law men should obey is the Sharia. We, can, we cannot let them win this discussion. I'm deeply concerned about this development. Democracy is about tolerance, but we must be very careful that we don't make this mistake of letting our efforts to be tolerant turn to us into ignorant do-gooders. <clears throat> In Denmark, there exists what I like to call an unholy alliance between the Danish left wing and the extremists. The left wing is often so concerned with being tolerant that they are willing to let the Islamists get away with just about anything. I strongly disagree with them. Certain things cannot be tolerated. When the democratic values are treated, we have to draw the line. We must not close our eyes when the freedom in our society is compromised. We have to fight back when democracy is be, being challenged. And we have to stand our ground when this happens. It doesn't matter whether this treat comes from the European Muslims or from the Middle Eastern or North African uh, countries. When we hear the, the demand that Muslims want to live by Sharia law, we should never give in. Sharia and democracy can never exist side by side. And let me tell you why. Uh, Sharia doesn't acknowledge any law, other law than the law of God. It is built upon the consider consideration for the community instead of that of the individual. It allows for polygamy and women and children being degraded to man's property Sharia totally undermines the rule of law. Therefore, Sharia and democracy is, are like fire and water. We have to actively address this issue and we have to find a way in which we, without undermining the right to freedom of religion, take democracy and the right to freedom of speech in defense. 
In Denmark and in the rest of Europe, democracy and the freedom rights are not only being challenged by Islamists. Sometimes the government and the authorities actually make matters worse on their own. One of the biggest problems is that the government often ends up supporting the Islamist, the Islamist cause when trying to support freedom of religion. Let me try to show you what I mean by saying this. Before the cartoon crisis in Denmark, the extremists were perceived as the real Muslims, as if they were only one kind of uh, Muslims. There are numerous ways of practicing Islam, like there is many ways of being Christian. In Denmark, extremists were, before the cartoon crisis, seen as experts in Islam. The people who match it, uh, the general justice of what a Muslim looks like, were often automatically perceived as the legitimate, legitimate Muslims. Some of the imams that were the most active in accelerating the cartoon crisis were before that often used as advisors in matters of in matters of regarding Islam, Muslims, and integration issues. They were used by the Danish version of FBI, PET, as well as the Danish government and other authorities, even the Prime Minister of Denmark, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, before the Khartoum crisis, he conferred with them as consulting uh, on integration issues. Everybody within the state seemed to have a common agreement that there was only one kind of Muslim, only one way to be a real Muslim, and that those who were the loudest about their faith also were the ones who had the right on their side. Hereby, the government helped painting a picture where extreme interpretations of Islam were the real ones. I often warned about this misunderstanding. <clears throat> But before the cartoon crisis, nobody was interested in really understanding and understanding what I meant. When the crisis was still at its high point, I and other progressive Muslims, we united and founded the organization Democratic Muslims. We wanted to build a bridge to the Danish society, but also a bridge to the Muslim world. We wanted to show the, the general public and the moderate Muslims that there was an alternative to the extreme point of view. We refused to associate Islam with the uh, ugly and inhuman acts. That, that, is, was, that was possible, that uh, it was possible to be real Muslim without being extreme. We all signed ten main principles, including that we were pro-democracy and that no laws were above, above the state. Under normal uh, circumstances, I'm against forming this kind of groups or organizations. Groups should, in my opinion, never be founded on the basis of ethnicity or religious beliefs because that often leads to isolation from the rest of the society. Of course, we also got a lot of criticism for forming this organization. One of the leading Danish Muslim researchers was accusing us of monopolizing democracy, which was never our intention. But during the cartoon crisis, I realized that almost none of the Danish were able to the squinch between moderates and extremists. The common belief was that there, were, there was only one group of Muslims in Denmark. This is, of course, was a great misunderstanding, and we had to get it out of the way. I believe that one of the most important outcomes of the cartoon crisis in Denmark probably was that the general Danish public's attention was drawn to differences among the various group of Muslims. In Denmark, in general, we do not any longer say the Muslims. 
people in Denmark are now very much aware that there are many types of Muslims. Furthermore, the crisis also exhibited the Islamist true colors. This is, this is a very important because this new insight helps eliminate the belief in stereotypes. That's why I, and I say it with a smile, I will recommend the other Western countries and the United States to have a cartoon crisis. <clears throat> Sadly, other uh, United States, other European countries haven't learned to differentiate, differentiate between Muslims yet. In Great Britain, United Kingdom, for instance, they still listen to the Muslim British Council, even though most people know that they are extreme. We need to get rid of this belief because only through this can we learn to see the difference between the people who shout the loudest and the general opinion of the murdered Muslims. It is furthermore only through this insight we can help the moderates and make sure they are not suppressed by the extremists. Let me illustrate why this is so important and what the consequence of being able to tell the difference might be. A couple of years ago, a small group of young Muslims in a high school, high school, uh, some high school stu students wanted a prayer room in the school. They wanted to pray in the school. They were quite loud about it. They were claiming to be discriminated against because they couldn't practice their religion properly. The school board didn't want to be preserved as intolerant. It wanted people to see it as an open-minded and tolerant place. Therefore, it gave, it, it gave in to the demands of the young Islamists and gave them a prior room. In reality, the larger group of the school's Muslim students wasn't praying five times a day, and they didn't want to. Only a very small part of the Muslim students were actually interested in getting this room. After the management installed the praying room, many, many of the moderate Muslims were boiled into praying during school hours. In this way, the minority within the minority was setting the agenda for the majority of the Muslim students. So when Western societies gave in and accepted the demands from the minority in the minority, then you suppress the majority in the minority. This situation was far from the good intentions that led the school board into erecting the facility in the first place. Nevertheless, the result speaks for itself. The good intentions of the school board ended up forcing a strict religious practice on the moderate Muslims at the school. It is a problem that the moderate Muslims often have to face in their everyday life. This is one of the main reasons why the amount of the Islamists is growing in the West. And it is an issue that we have to take in, into serious consideration when we are addressing the subject of religious freedom. But sadly, this is not the only way we are creating obstacles for a successful integration. I talked to a social worker who is part of a task force that helps young people who are involved in criminality. These adults are supposed to help by acting as role models and advisors to the young men and women they are helping. In order for the young criminals to be able to relate to their assigned role models, these have to come from different backgrounds. The Danish social worker told me that in Denmark extremists are often allowed to work in the area of integration uh, with more adjusted youngsters. She, the social workers, had several colleagues who, are, who were extra, uh, Islamists. The problem is that such jobs give them legit legitimacy. Remember that we are dealing with a group of people who are easy to influence. 
the young people. Often the young Muslim men who are successfully removed from the criminal environment are turned to be extremists. I prefer them criminals. This is a highly problematic and unwanted result that creates more problems than it solves. But what can we do to help the moderate Muslims? First of all, realize that the true battle, battle against extremism must come from the Muslims themselves. What can be done is to support, help, and in any possible way try to make sure that the moderate aren't being suppressed by the Islamists. Ensure that they feel safe enough to raise their voice, uh, voice against them. At the moment, safety is a real concern of many moderates and keeping them from t uh, taking a clear stand against extremists. The Islamists, on the other hand, are really good at playing the role of the victims in the society. Intellectuals always seem to buy this premise. We, are, we have to confront and put this misunderstanding to an end. The Islamists want tolerance. They have to start by being tolerant themselves. We cannot accept uh, to live in a multicultural world if we let one religion dictate how people of other religions should live their lives. In my opinion, Islam needs not a ref uh, reformation but a revolution. It needs to be updated. Islam needs a spring. This is probably too much to expect at the moment, but my stand is built upon the assumption that like we have, we have seen the Arab Spring, changes have to come from the people themselves. Changes cannot be forced on people. If they should fight for change, they first have, have to wish for it. Therefore, I also believe that Muslims have a better chance of preventing other Muslims from becoming extremists than non-Muslims do. What the surrounding society and the government can do is to give the progressive democratic Muslims and the moderate Muslims better conditions and a better chance of getting the upper hand. Thank you. I have to thank uh, Federalist Society for giving all of us today uh, the podium to uh, air our grievances against Islamism. And Nina and Paul, thank you for being brave enough to write this book. <clears throat> um, uh, there has been this uh, perception among uh, some American pro progressives that all Muslims are hardline practicing anti-American fanatics, as described by the few petrofinanced Islamist organizations, the very small progressive groups whose job is to make loud accusations and deceptive claims against America in the name of American Muslim community. In fact, the fact is, that American Muslim com Muslims are as diverse as American Christians are. We came from three different continents, many different countries and cultures, different languages, different races, and different historical backgrounds and identities. We are of many different sects of Islam. That is another extra barrier that separates us from each other. Therefore, there is no such a thing as one American Muslim community. Unfortunately, for some of the members of progressive elites, are also making these Islamist groups into political representatives of Muslims in the United States, elevating them to a leadership role that does not and will never exist. 
as I said, there is no one united Muslim community by any means for any national leadership that is being claimed by the organizations who follow the Muslim Brotherhood policies in North America. Many organizations like CARE, ISNA, MPAC, and others, and NIAC also, are established by foreign petro-rich Muslim governments to take advantage of two words, American Muslim, to in infiltrate in the system, establish influence, and implement their policies of Islamization of America, sanctioned by progressive Americans. These are the same governments whose citizens are fleeing to the Western democracies because they, as thinking humans, like the Western civilization better than Islamist way of life. Muslims did not come to America to bring the Sharia law. We came to get away from Sharia law. Exactly like all other immigrants, some came to get away from poverty, to have the American dream of prosperity. We came to live in freedom, have equal rights and opportunities, and away from the oppressive uh, oppression of the sixth century patriarchal hierarchies. The large majority of American Muslims are moderates or non-practicing, secular. We like the protection of our secular laws for Muslim women also, and hope that the American judges will vote according to the American laws, not the Sharia laws, when it comes to Muslim American women. The large majority of American Muslims who have fed the Islamic culture, who have fled the Islamic culture, refuse any such leadership. Many refuse the leadership of a totally different culture and different sect other than their own. No organization can even re represent such a diverse group of people. Islamists claim that they are protecting the rights of American Muslims. However, American Muslims believe that their rights are already protected by American Constitution, and they have no need for Islamist protectors. They feel that what is more damaging to the image of the American Muslims are the same petro organizations, actions, and statements. It is the people like Imam Raouf and his mosque. It is CARE, ISNA, MPAC, NIAC, and the other lobbyists of the foreign petro-rich Muslim powers in the Middle East. It is the policies of intimidation, deliberate lawsuits against our American institutions that undermine our democracy and makes life difficult for the average Muslims who want to be left alone. In fact, we need our national security to protect us, the silent majority of American Muslims, from petro-Islamists and stop the policies of appeasement. We need our polit politicians, the media, and academia to get educated by hearing our side of the issues and bring us into the discussions also. We are the majority, the real members of the society who should be our government's advisors and partners for the sake of our country and freedom. It is for the benefit of all if we do not allow only one small group to dominate the discussion of Islamism. In America, the majority is listened to but in the case of American Muslims, the majority is totally ignored. 
the alliance between American progressives and the regressive Islamists is nothing but the highest form of discrimination against the American Muslim immigrants. Petro-Islamists have penetrated and infiltrated the White House, Congress, the State Department, Voice of America, Department of Justice, and the main decision-making center of the United States government. The foreign policy advisors on Hamas, Hezbollah, the Iranian regime, and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, Syria, Tunisia, Libya, and Jordan are the Islamist radical lobbies. Advisors are hired from amongst these organizations and the active foreign lobbyists, not from the Muslim communities, leaderships, are totally, who are totally ignored. Islamist men are in charge of the grants approvals in most organizations like NED. And without their approval, the non-Islamist activists will never receive any grants, especially if it is for the Muslim women. Grants that are approved by the Congress are given to the universities by the State Department that will be sent spent on the Islamist causes, not for the support of the young silent majority. The Islamists like care are among the so-called insiders who get the attention. They have full-time employees and propaganda experts whose only goal is lobbying for Islamist policies in the name of American Muslim community. But if you are an immigrant who has never lived in a democratic society, you do not know how to organize. And under the circumstances, most Muslims want to hide and stay away from politics for the fear of petro-Islamist backlash. Organizations like our American Islamic Leadership Councils that is made of diverse and concerned American Muslims among the silent majority receives no recognition and no support from our government and certainly not from the progressive media or academia. Almost all government organizations have been intimidated by the alliance of progressive America and regressive petro-Islamists to keep the Muslim communities out of the equation, the real Muslims. And people like myself and Dr. Zuhdi Jasser are outrightly removed from our government's advisory list. Thank you. Two very excellent uh, presentations. What's remarkable is despite so many differences between this country and Europe, how similar in, in, in not only in broad thrust but in detail are some of the concerns about the reaction of both the governments and the media that empowers uh, radical forces and disempowers the more moderate Muslims. So I found it fascinating. As promised, we're going to have some questions. I'm going to call on you. Please identify yourself and keep them uh, all. Uh, yes, please come. I, I stand corrected. Please come to the microphone up front and, uh, and uh, pose a question. Please keep them short. <laughs> Hi, my name is Al Gombas. I'm on the uh, House Subcommittee for Africa, Global Health, and Human Rights. Um, numerous speakers today have discussed this this uh, nexus between the, the progressives, uh, the progressive liberals, and the uh, repressive Islamists. And I can't for the life of me figure out what the attraction is. I'm wondering if, if uh, maybe either of you have an idea and you can speak to um, what this fascination is and why these two that, uh, in terms of ideology, you would think would be opposed to each other, have formed such a, a close relationship. Uh, 
request the end. Um, the alliance between the left and the Islamists uh, uh, is uh, historical. It goes back to the Cold War, to the Soviet Union, the propagandas of KGB in the Middle East, anti-America, to stop America from uh, getting a foothold in the Middle East because the Russians have always considered Middle East their backyard. And after 200 years of total influence and domination, in the Middle East, after the Second World War, America stepped in, a young, energetic, and democratic uh, uh, country who did not really uh, need that much of, a, uh, of anything, and they supported freedom and democracy, education, and, uh, and uh, liberalization uh, in the Middle East, which was against what the Russians, and let's say uh, historical European uh, colonialism wanted that had been doing for 200 years in the Middle East. So from there, those propagandas of the of the Cold War, uh, uh, the Islamism and sort of left uh, uh, Marxism became ally aligned and became friendly, and it. Like everything else, it flowed into the West and to America also. I do agree. Uh, a part of it is uh, historical. Uh, it goes back to the, you know, the white man burden <laughs> in the 18th century. And uh, that's one uh, reason. The other reason is the Islamists, when it comes to political uh, platform are uh, on the left wing when it comes to welfare and uh, social issues and so on. Uh, when it comes to family policy, they are uh, very, very right wing. <laughs> uh, but uh, I also have to say that uh, we talk about clash between civilizations. In my opinion, the the largest clash is in in the Muslim civilization. Uh, you know, the <coughs> uh, in Denmark, I need uh, bodyguards, not uh, one of the. You know, we have a lot of Danish politicians who are very much more uh, criticizing Islam and the Muslim. They do not need bodyguards. <laughs> But, but these Islamists, they uh, hate other Muslims much more than they hate Christian or Jews and other people. Uh, during the Khartoum crisis, there were, we saw a film, one of the imams, uh, he told uh, the journalist that uh, he had people like me much more than he had other. Uh, he was one of those who... Uh, he uh, talked about uh, putting a bomb in my house and so on. Uh, and that's what, uh, it was one of our problems uh, when we established the organization Moderate Muslims. A lot of those members who were with us in the beginning, they uh, started to go back to their homes because they had, it had consequence to be active in this, uh, in this organization. Some of them were beaten and treated and so on. So it's not uh, free to be active in these organizations. And that's why I, I say we have to help those who want to take this fight, help them and not be against them. So that's, you know, in, in the Danish media, I'm all, all, almost all the time in defensive because the media is automatically with these uh, Islamists because they are the real Muslims. Right. If I may uh, pose uh, one, one question of my own and then we'll get back to the audience. Um, I, I understand what the problem is and of course the, the radicals are using quite freely the instruments of the free society including lawsuits and, and other things we tend to call lawfare. Uh, why there is no pushback? on the side of a moderate. Two sides can play the same game. They can bring lawsuits, so can you. There are ways of challenging intimidation. 
and harassment, and in many ways it does not require the state to do that. You can do it on your own. They had the money. I don't. Petrol. You know, it, it costs a lot of money to go to the court. <laughs> in Denmark, I don't know about that, but in Denmark, if you sue me, uh, you know, you, you have a lot of uh, lawyers in Denmark who do it free for these people. So do we. But uh. <laughs> there should be lawyers who would be willing to do it uh, for your side as well. But so it, it really has not happened uh, in a sense of deploying the same the same tactics. What, what about uh, what about you? Well, in America, it's as I said, these people uh, have uh, unlimited funding, petrol dollars, and uh, our organizations like ours, we have to spend from our pocket because we don't get any funding from anybody or anywhere, and we have to work for a living also, and then part-time activism, and then spend for for these kind of uh, activities also, which makes it uh, difficult, very difficult. I don't know if you remember one of the Danish newspaper, Politiken, uh, the editor, he was out, uh, he went to London and said, sorry for printing the cartoons, because uh, Yamani's son, you know Yamani, he used to be ma yeah. minister of uh, oil. In okay. Saudi Arabia. Yeah, his son, he's a lawyer in London, and he told the Danish newspaper, I will sue you, get you to the courtroom, until bankruptcy. So uh, the, the editor of the Politiken, he went to London and said, sorry to the whole Muslim world. Pressing. Please. Hi, Faith McDonald from the Institute on Religion and Democracy. Thank you both very much for what you've said and for what you're doing. Um, Amanda, you talked about the marginalization of moderate Muslims and of the real moderate Muslims. And uh, one area where I have seen this taking place is between um, church and Muslim relations. Uh, just as the FBI does, just as the Department of Justice does, the churches reach out to the extremists who they say are moderates. They, they defend Imam Rauf, they uh, invite imams from the 9-11 uh, mosque on Route 7 to come to the church. Um, can you tell us something about how we can help churches to understand who they should be making relations with instead? Thank you. Well, practically uh, every Muslim that people work with at, at, at work, wherever they are, uh, Muslims that, I, that they meet in, in the stores, there are uh, regular, regular average people who work for a living, they taxpayers, raising children, saving for the kids' college. 99% uh, of, of the people who live and have nothing to do with any one of these things and don't want to know any, any about these things. Because what's going on is uh, in American Muslim community, first of all, mostly are afraid of backlash, so they hide. They don't, they don't um, um, communicate with everybody outrightly and freely. Uh, second, they are too busy surviving and making a living, raising their kids, so they don't have time for these things. Thirdly, they don't know how to organize, most of them the immigrants, and they don't even have the budget if they wanted to organize. And, uh, and so, um, uh, but if you, you don't, you can't go to any special place to find Muslims, they are everywhere, at the store, at the school, the children are at the same school your children are, and uh, you can approach and talk and, and, uh, and uh, communicate with, with, with everybody, and uh, yes. Yes. Did you all hear the question? Uh, yes. Speak um, a little bit about your coalition. Yes. Um, our coalition is uh, Ally, uh, American Islamic uh, Leadership Council. And uh, this, unlike the other organizations who claim they, rep they represent 
American Muslims. Um, this is a real diverse organization. That means we are from many different countries and cultures. We don't, our common language is English. We don't speak each other's language. Uh, and uh, we're all concerned about our homeland security. Um, we were so concerned about our homeland security that we wrote a white paper for the, for the White House uh, 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 as our opinion how our government should approach our, our, uh, our uh, uh, homeland security. And um, we rejected what the White House had put out. And um, we um, we love our constitution. Uh, we uh, we we love America. We want to keep everything the way it is, and we want to enjoy what has been built here, and um, and um, and and what annoys us is these groups, groups like Care, Isna, and. Uh, and uh, the lobbyists of the uh, of foreign governments. I know as an Iranian American, I know Iran has two or three, Iranian regime has two or three lobbyist organizations right here in Washington, D.C., who are lobbying, the, who are the advisors at the State Department, Mrs. Clinton's advisors, who are advisors at the White House, and the father and son, two of them, and uh, and 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 we know that the influence that those organizations have in American policies uh, is very damaging to our country, to our America. And what we believe is that human rights and freedom should be promoted as the power and policy of the United States, so that the people would be happy living in their own country. As I said uh, before, uh, you need a cartoon uh, crisis uh, so you can start differ between the, 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 the Muslims. Not in Denmark, but in other Western countries and United States, uh, the decision makers are very naive uh, uh, when it comes to the question of Islam and the Muslims. Uh, I had a uh, you can read about it in WikiLeaks. I had an uh, experience with the uh, former uh, U.S. ambassador in Denmark, James Kane, uh, when, uh, you know, the year of the cartoon uh, crisis in 06, 2006, uh, he invited uh, uh, the imams, those who uh, were the troublemaker during the Khartoum crisis. He invited them home to the iftar, you know, the iftar when uh, Ramadan started. And uh, he didn't invite our organization, moderate Muslims. We, uh, the polls uh, told us and uh, surveyed that 25% uh, of the Danish Muslims supported us, but we didn't uh, be invited. And then I went to the Danish media and said, uh, James Kane, the U.S. ambassador in Denmark, he's, a, uh, he's an idiot. Uh, <laughs> uh, useful, sorry, useful idiot. <laughs> he did not mince words. Uh, useful idiot. And then he said, why do you call me useful idiot? I want to talk with everybody. And then I asked him, would you also have invited Ku Klux Klan leader to eat with you in the embassy. It's an American ter territory. Those people who, who we invited to, to his home, I'm sure they wouldn't get a visum to get to the United States of America. <laughs> but uh, he invited uh, people who uh, made trouble in Denmark and started the cartoon crisis. That's naive. Let me... Uh... Just to follow up on that, ask you. Uh, WikiLeaks, I have to follow it up. And then he uh, wrote a letter to the foreign department and told them if Nasser Carter comes to the United States, don't they give him access to important meetings, even though I was a member of the parliament. <laughs> so you can read about it in WikiLeaks. <laughs> yes, there's something 
occasionally good about those leaks. Uh, <laughs> now, my question was going to be this. I mean, to, to what extent th this problem can be at least partially addressed, the, the ignorance and, uh, and erroneous perceptions of who are the true representatives of the Muslim community by having congressional hearings. As you know, we had a little bit of an experience here uh, with uh, hearings on the, on the House side and quite a bit of emotion about it. I don't know what has been your experience in, in, in Denmark, for example, to have a serious discussion. That's what legislatures are supposed to do, is you invite people and they testify and, uh, and produce some educational uh, uh, results, hopefully, for the society as a whole, for the body polity. Which people? Uh, well, inviting moderate Muslims and like you and, and others, and having a bit of a dialogue. It's, it's difficult for the media to ignore if you have yeah. legislative uh, hearings. That, that's what uh, happens in Denmark now. You know, the media do not talk any longer with these imams. No longer. Uh, they have been isolated since the Khartoum crisis. The prime minister said, and the other minister, uh, they are not welcome to the government offices. We, we only want to talk with the moderates with those who want to combine democracy with uh, Islam, with integration. Uh, so uh, it, I think it would be a good idea if the decision makers take a, a position and say we are with the moderates. Obviously, uh, I understand better when you say about the uh, cartoon crisis having been a, a blessing in some ways. What about, uh, what about you, man? Any... Anything more, in your opinion, that useful that Congress can do in this area? Uh, uh, sure, definitely. They can, uh, uh, as I said, most of the members of the Congress are uh, under the influence of the, of the other organization, the Petro organizations that I call them, Petro-Islamists. And, uh, and uh, there aren't that many of uh, us as activists to fill out the gap between what they do and what we need to do. But uh, there are some of the members of the Congress uh, who uh, uh, do um, make arrangements for uh, conferences and, and, uh, and talks among the Muslims. Most of the time, those uh, organizations don't want to come and sit with us. In the same in the same uh, meetings. Thank you. Please, one one more. Then I think we're out of time. Go ahead. Thank you, Sylvia Ross. Um, I'm having a difficult time reconciling a number of things, and I figured since this is the Federalist Society, I'd throw this question out there. Um, we conveniently want to pull out the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence to cite that our civil liberties and our rights come from the laws of nature and of nature's God. How do we overcome two primary questions? One, what is the source of law? Is it man or is it God? And if so, which God would it be to rebut an argument by Islamists that it's their God that we're talking about without actually looking at what the founders and the framers understood from a Western reference was that God. Um, it's uh, kind of philosophical and uh, complicated uh, question to answer just like this, but um, of course it's all man, and of course it's always the power uh, not humanity, and of course uh, in societies that have been uh, deprived of education and progress and, uh, and enlightenment, um, uh, the powerful wants to keep the power, doesn't want to let the power go. Uh, one of the problems that I look at as a, as a woman is that the... Um, that the Islamic patriarchal hierarchy is very nervous and worried about losing the constituency because women are now looking at equal rights, young people want to be free, and uh, they, uh, they cannot stop the global communication systems. 
they are losing the ground to the one of the problems that Islamists have with America is America's freedom and democracy is a um, is contagious no matter how hard the patriarchal hierarchy has been trying younger generations always want to gravitate towards the freedom it's the human nature to gravitate towards freedom and so they are losing grounds and therefore they are trying the more grounds they lose the harder they fight let me just add one thing I and mean, it's not to get in the long discussion of the constitution and the founding but the the, the framers have been uh, extremely successful in creating a legal and political system that while it's animated in a certain level by their vision of religion and, and God is profoundly uh, secular. And we don't have religious oaths of office. We do not have established religion, if anything. Um, you know, a lot of people would argue that after 200 plus years of, of, of our judicial experience, the religion has been effectively pushed out of a public marketplace. So there's certainly no tension in, in a sense, and maybe I misunderstood your question, that you know, here's the United States uh, that, that is a, essentially a Judeo-Christian nation in terms of our foundational experience, how easy it is for us to, to have a dialogue with people who claim our source of revealed truths. And that would be true if we had a state religion, if we had a, uh, yeah, governmental institutions that were fused with religion. We don't. So, uh, uh, and again, the framers were by and large quite religious, but they, they, they were very keen not to have religion play uh, a, a prominent political role. And as I said, they, it played a more prominent role in the 18th and early 19th century. By now, I mean, the, the, one, uh, the, the one area where, you know, if you're an atheist or if you believe in, uh, in various other things, you can have your voice heard. But God help you, no pun intended, if, if, you're, if you're trying to bring particularly Christianity to speak. Uh, and again, you can look at all the court cases about uh, uh, the difficulty of having religious expressions and turn on the TV and, you know, crosses being taken down and uh, they've been in place in some public park for decades and debates about is it primarily secular symbols. So I, I'm not worried about America being overtaken by uh, by, uh, by uh, Judeo-Christian uh, influence. It's just not going to happen. Let me just say this, what is a source of law is a philosophical question, it is not a legal question, it is not a political question. We can agree and disagree about it, for some of us it is rooted in Christianity, for other people it may be rooted in, in, in a totally different school of thought, but the good story we can tell to others who are pushing a fairly religiously infused style of governance is that's not what we do. So when we're certainly not disfavoring Islam over other religions, we're not favoring any religions, but but anyway, but that's a different discussion. Well, we, we but then we think that Sharia is fundamentally compatible with the United States. Well, of course, of course it is. I, I, but <laughs> it should be more of a No, no, it, it, it cannot. Um, I, you know, the, the, the notion that Sharia would, would be recognized here, um, I mean, I, I know there is some discussion about this at the state level, but I, I, I'm not terribly worried about it. Well, I'm much more worried about the role of Sharia in Europe, particularly in places like England where a large part of a political establishment seems to be flirting with that notion, but I, I'm not worried about Sharia being, being embraced here. Well, I think we're out of time. Thank you, everybody. It's been a great conference, certainly very, very uh, interesting and, and exciting. Thank you.